All right. I think I'm going to get started. So hello. Um, this has been a really awesome conference. It's very exciting. i um, very thankful that I was invited to speak here. My first time in Finland. Uh, so far, having a pretty good time. So last talk of the day, I'm not going to be, it's not going to be a very technical talk. I actually thought it would be interesting to um, talk a little bit about the history of ClojureScript. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on a bit uh, because I think it's been long enough that I think, uh, like, raise your hand if you've been using ClojureScript for five years. Raise your hand. Okay, exactly. Uh, four years. Okay. Three years. Uh, two years. And then one year. So yeah, so well, probably the last two, right? That's um, a lot of people um, uh, just aren't going to be familiar with the early history. Uh, and it's a long and winding road, and I think there's some fun highlights, and it'll give you some perspective on how closure script development uh, works. All right, so just a little quickly about me. I'm David Nolan. I'm a software engineer at Cognitech. Uh, Cognitech is a software consultancy. Uh, we steward Clojure uh, and ClojureScript. I'm the lead developer of ClojureScript. And we also have a product called Datomic, uh, which is really cool. You should check it out. Um, so uh, a couple weeks ago, ClojureScript finally got a website. Uh, uh, again, I'm not sure. Well, go ahead. <laughs> um, huge shout out to Alex Miller uh, for pushing this through. Um, we basically repurposed repurpose the closure.org website, uh, the infrastructure for that, took the design, and then we made a bunch of changes on the content uh, to be more relevant to ClojureScript. Uh, so for those of you who've been using ClojureScript for a while, you know that ClojureScript is really pretty cool tech. Uh, it's pretty reliable tech. Uh, but for outsiders, people who are coming into the first time, it's nice to finally have a public face. It really makes it feel like uh, ClojureScript has uh, grown up. Uh, so. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's been a long, extremely long process to get to where we are today, and I want to um, talk about it. Um, uh, I, I mean, I when I use ClojureScript, and I use ClojureScript at work, uh, you know, today it's like, um, it's like we've come so very, 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 very far. Uh, for me, I, when I use ClojureScript, even though, that I work, even though I work on the compiler, every time I have Fig Wheel or I'm building my project, it's like, this is like magic, this is amazing. Uh, so even though I've been heavily involved in this development, it still feels like uh, we've climbed an incredible uh, mountain. And so I want to point out some sort of interesting waypoints along the way. Again, um, specifically things that people may not know about. So what were the first five years like? So five years ago, um, I was not doing closure. I was at the New York Times in the newsroom uh, working on a team called Interactive News, building news applications. And uh, our stack was uh, Ruby on Rails, and I was doing JavaScript and uh, jQuery. Uh, and, th and this was fine. I, at the time, it was 2011, um, I was actually on the same team as Jeremy Ashkenaz. And Jeremy sort of became famous because he developed something called CoffeeScript. Uh, so even though you had things like GWT, Google's GW GWT, which took Java and compiled it to JavaScript, um, compiling to JavaScript really wasn't that popular of a thing among JavaScript developers. And Jeremy sort of, CoffeeScript sort of made that, oh, maybe compiling to JavaScript is not such a, a, a wacky idea. And in fact, we ended up using CoffeeScript a little bit here and there at the times. Um, and, and people thought it was cool. And so it was, there was a, it was the beginning of a transition, I think, in the sort of uh, front-end mainstream world that maybe compiling to JavaScript isn't totally uh, a crazy thing to do. Um, so I was also like, ah, CoffeeScript's cool. Uh, maybe there's, you know, I'm a Lisp person. I'm not, I really wasn't much of a, a Ruby person. I mean, I was happy to use it to build the apps that we were building, but I was a Lisp person. So I started being like, well, maybe there's a cool Lisp that compiles um, uh, to JavaScript. At the time, Clojure for me was a hobby language. Um, and there was kind of an experimental thing called ClojureScript back in the day by this person, Chris Hauser, who was great. Uh, but it wasn't really um, ready for prime time. And I came across this thing called scheme to js which was a almost fully compliant version of Scheme R5RS um, by somebody whose name is Florian Loisch. And actually, he ended up going to Google to work on Dart, um, but specifically the Dart to JS compiler, since he had had a lot of experience uh, figuring that problem out for scheme to js uh, but the problem with scheme to js it was really cool, except it didn't have macros. And so, you know, I'd, I'd, I had totally 
you know, been sold on closure and common lisp and, you know, proper scheme. And I was like, ah, I'm not going to use this. It doesn't have macros. Um, and so I, so I was a bit dejected. So I was going to stick with co uh, CoffeeScript. Uh, but it turned out, I researched this, I think, in June or May of 2011. And um, two months later, uh, Relevant said, we're going to make a really big announcement at Clojure NYC, which is, I, I'm based in New York. It's a local um, user group there. Uh, this was probably one of the most well-attended uh, Clojure uh, meetups. And the big announcement, of course, was ClojureScript. This was July 2011. Um, and Richicky gave a great presentation. In many, in many ways, everything he talked about five years ago uh, remains true today. I think the big idea behind ClojureScript is reach. So even though um, I think uh, people have, uh, through Clojure, either maybe you're already on the JVM, you're like, great, I can do, I can use a more interesting language and still target the JVM, or you're getting introduced to the JVM, you're like, oh, the JVM is pretty cool technology if you have a better programming language. Um, but, the, but the problem is with the JVM, of course, is that there are a lot of places where the JVM is not an option. Um, you know, we, this was, people were aware of this even back then, right? I, you know, Apple has a very specific way they want people to develop for iOS. You probably were never going to be able to get the JVM on iOS. Um, if you're targeting clients, uh, it often means you're building web applications, and you know people aren't building applets uh, for um, in the browser anymore. So JavaScript, more or less, um, was the way to get to places um, the JVM couldn't go, and that's one of the big ideas. The other big idea, and I'm going to emphasize this quite a bit today, is uh, when Rich uh, talked about ClojureScript, he talked about it as the first pass at this sort of idea of closure and closure. Uh, so closure script was going to be written entirely in closure. So if people don't know, closure's implementation is almost entirely in Java, the compiler and the data structures. So closure script was the first time um, a dialect of closure was going to be written in closure itself. And the other cool thing was is that at the bottom of the language protocols would be a fundamental thing. And so uh, I've been doing closure as a hobby and then now of, as for work, of course, since about 2008. And I remember it was the, uh, like, January 2011, Rich Hickey popped onto the IRC channel and said, what if there was a version of closure with protocols at the bottom? And then he, like, left. <laughs> and then, you know, six months later, you, you, you figure out what he was talking about. Okay, so uh, closure script existed for two or three months before I actually was involved. This is my very first commit. Um, to Clojure Script, right here, uh, eight lines of code if you discount the extra line of white space. Um, and this is a uh, def macro for reify. Uh, I had started playing around with Clojure Script. You could, you could download the repo, repo and there were some scripts to run it. And I was running the REPL and I was like, reify. And boom, there was an error because reify wasn't implemented yet. I was like, oh. And I popped onto um, the mailing list and I said, why isn't there reify? And they're like, well, it hasn't been done yet. Um, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll submit a patch for reify. And I was, okay, this is going to take uh, weeks. You know, the, the, the closure script compiler is going to be so complicated. There's no way I can, you know, it's going to take a lot of time. And then I, s I read the macro file and I looked around. I was like, oh, wow, this is just closure. It's, it's actually pretty straightforward and simple. And I saw that I could implement reify in about eight lines of code. And this was really awesome. Rich Hickey and Chris Hauser were both like, wow, that's so cool. Only eight lines of code to get reify. And this was my, this got me commit rights to Clojure Script. And from that point forward, you know, I was one of the committers and I would sort of, um, sort of deal with JIRA and make sure that patches were flowing through consistently. Because for the first two years, again, uh, Clojure Script was only going to succeed if people believed it was going to succeed. Um, there was just a ton of work to do. Uh, what they shipped, um, uh, that first thing that they shipped was, you know, had a lot of promise, um, but didn't have that much capability. Uh, it was going to be a long road. Um, but it was still actually pretty useful out the door. Um, but the one, one huge problem was that closure script uh, in typical, uh, I think, Rich Hickeyan fashion, it didn't really follow what the mainstream was doing. It, it definitely had very sound technical decisions, but maybe it at the expense of being something was, that was familiar to the average developer that was doing front-end work. Front-end in 2011 was all jQuery. And then Rich Hickey's like, we're going to do this thing. We're going to use this thing you've never used called Google Closure Compiler and this library you've never heard of called Google Closure Library. Um, so I think that's a, it was a lot of unfamiliarity for people that would want to use ClojureScript. So Relevance put together this awesome thing called ClojureScript 1. Um, and it was, it was not a tool. It was just a template project. It was a template project showing you that you could build 
a reasonable application, and to, to basically demonstrate that all the functionality that people wanted from jQuery or whatever, it was already there uh, in Google Closure Library. Google Closure Library, to this day, is heavily developed by Google Closure, right? That is the thing that Google's actually using to build all their JavaScript applications. Closure Library uh, and the Closure Compiler. Um, so just an incredible amount of functionality there. And I think this sort of opened up the eyes uh, of some people. Oh, maybe the Closure Library thing uh, wasn't such a bad idea. Um, but, but even at that point, uh, you had this problem in that ClojureScript 1 was kind of a template, and it was still very awkward to get anything done. Uh, at, by 2011, Linegan had taken the Clojure world by storm. I mean, it's basically, if it wasn't a Linegan plugin, chances are nobody was going to use your thing. Um, and this was something that was just missing. There was no easy way to integrate um, the ClojureScript compiler into your projects, right? It, you, you had to clone the repo, and then you had to, like, run all these custom scripts. It was very tedious and not that fun. And so Evan Mazeski, huge shout out, he's no longer that active in the ClojureScript community, but the fact that he worked on this and made it um, basically trivial for people to build a ring application and then uh, include CLJS build as a plugin, um, uh, it really lowered the barrier. And at this point, you started, you finally, this was like eight months in, two or nine months in, you finally saw Clojure programmers being like, okay, I'm going to give uh, ClojureScript a chance. And this was, you know, we're slowly building momentum. So eight, nine months in, right? The first eight, nine months sounds like a cool idea, but nothing much is happening. When CLJS build appears, um, it starts becoming more active. Uh, it's actually now maintained by um, um, uh, uh, Maria Geller, and we'll talk about more about her later. Um, oh, so that's another thing. So um, I'm not sure how many people know that uh, ClojureScript did not ship with persistent data structures. Uh, the first year, almost the first year, uh, ClojureScript only had copy on write. It was these very naive, uh, slow, full copy on write data structures. They had the same uh, interface as the, what you're used to in, in Clojure, but they were not persistent data structures. Uh, in fact, a lot of people were skeptical, right? Uh, because in 2011, um, the sort of JavaScript performance revolution was beginning. Uh, it hadn't really um, come to its full fruition. Uh, but the group leading the pack here was Google. So Google uh, hired a, a SWAT team of basically you know, the world's compiler experts led by Lars Bach. Lars Bach worked on Hotspot, right, the, you know, the, the JVM, and he also worked on Self. So somebody who had been working on optimizing compilers for more than a decade, or two decades already. So they had him working on JavaScript. And the strides that they were able to make are incredible, right? Um, and then suddenly we were like, well, what happens if we take the Java code for, the, like, persistent vector, the mo you know, a really s relatively simple persistent data structure, about 400 lines of Java? Um, we were like, well, what happens if we just try porting this, handwriting this to JavaScript and running it on V8? What, is, what are the performance numbers going to be? Uh, so uh, a gentleman named Lazo Torok, or Torok um, he did this, and when we looked at the numbers, we were like, this is in the ballpark. Like, not even an order of magnitude difference from the JVM. This is under an order of magnitude, within an order of magnitude of JVM performance. I think only like 4x slower. And this is 2011. That's, like, that's not even true today. Today, I think we're only like 1.5 times slower than the JVM for persistent vector perf. But this was, our, this was good enough to be exciting. Uh, clearly, it was going to be a huge win over copy on write. Um, so we did this. And then once we, once we showed that it was good in JavaScript, uh, uh, Laszlo did a version of 200 lines of, of uh, in ClojureScript of the a port of the JavaScript code. So we just faithfully ported the Java to JavaScript and then ported that uh, to ClojureScript. And this was sort of the beginning um, of this sort of persistent data structure revolution within ClojureScript because, again, these were done in Java. They weren't done in Clojure, right? So this was... Uh, the first time we were really going to do persistent data structures, um, all of them, in a dialect of closure itself. Uh, the, and the neat thing about doing this was that, you know, when you're doing performance work, you often, you know, peop when you look at benchmarks, it's always just a bunch of bullshit, right? It's just like, what? You're benchmarking something that doesn't matter. Um, and the cool thing about using persistent data structures to drive closure script perf was that this is something that everybody's going to depend on. If we make this fast, then we know that we're actually delivering on performance. So when Laszlo did this version, it what I did was, okay, why is it that 
this version, which looks like a faithful port of the JavaScript, is um, three times slower than the JavaScript. So it was the process of implementing the persistent data structures uh, that I was able to see what was wrong with ClojureScript code gen, right? So why are there function overhead calls? Oh, we're, we're not inlining all of our arithmetic operations, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think when, when I was done, we, again, he did not change his code. After I was done optimizing the compiler, I think we were only, uh, at that time, like 20 or 30% slower than they had written JavaScript, which is great. And of course, those were just weird artifacts of the way that JS engines work. I think now I, it's, you know, it's, it's like maybe it's 10% slower than writing this in JavaScript, at which point, who cares? Um, and then this kicked, uh, kicked off. There was so much excitement and in internally. I'm not saying that the outside world was excited about this, but internal to the Clojure community, once we showed that persistent data structures were viable on V8, and without a doubt, everybody else was going to catch up, like uh, JavaScript Core and SpiderMonkey would be competing against V8, so there was no doubt that um, what we showed was possible on V8. It was just a matter of time, so we might as well do the other persistent data structures. Uh, Mikko Markczyk, uh, 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 a fine Polish, uh, Poland, well he's Polish, uh, closure programmer and mathematician, he decided to take every single persistent data structure and do all the ports. Um, and it was great. So every time he would implement one, we would benchmark against um, the JVM as a baseline. We would find out what was wrong with the code gen. Um, and then I, I think a year, it was like a year and a couple months, we had all the persistent data structures ported and people ran their closure script applications. They were like, it's now 10 times faster, 20 times faster. 30 times faster. Um, so that was just a huge win, um, which is cool. So the persistent data structure stuff, now it's, it's now because um, a fa Facebook has something called Immutable JS, and a lot of people are talking about immutability, now mainstream programmers aren't scratching their heads when you say persistent data structures. But back in 2011, even though internally in the closure script community, we're like, yeah, this is so awesome, nobody in the mainstream cares, because they don't know what you're talking about. Like, they're like, okay, that sounds cool, it's computer science-y, that's neat, but like, what are you doing with this thing? This is the list, list, what are you actually making? Show me something. Uh, because most developers that are serious, they just want to know, how does this help me solve problems? And show me an example of how you solved a, a problem that I can understand, a more typical problem, um, and show me how your process or methodology or programming language is better than what I'm currently doing. And we didn't have any good examples of this because, again, it was very much internal to the Clojure community. And again, we only had convinced a small population within Clojure to tr give uh, Clojure Script a try. So a big sort of change here um, was the arrival of Lighttable because many programmers were excited about Lighttable. Lighttable was uh, basically supposed to come out the door with support for Clojure, Clojure Script, Python, and I believe Ruby at some point. Uh, but, but it was extremely exciting to the, pro the programming community at large, and um, very cool stuff, lots of innovative ideas about how to make the development process uh, sort of more uh, interesting, more interactive. Um, and uh, a lot of these ideas just got copied. Like, I mean, a lot of the ideas that appeared first in Lighttable just got copied over to, you know, Swift Playgrounds and uh, Xcode and, and uh, IntelliJ. So the impact that Lighttable had was huge, and Chris Granger, had written the entire thing in ClojureScript. The whole thing was written in ClojureScript. When, it, when they open sourced it, it was 11 to 12,000 lines of ClojureScript um, that integrated with Node WebKit. And you know, people were like, whoa, ClojureScript. You can do that with ClojureScript. You can build a very serious uh, application, a very impressive application with ClojureScript. And I think this was the beginning of a sort of change, both internal to the ClojureScript community, but also external to the ClojureScript community. OK, um, here's an example of what you can do. Uh, that's quite impressive and quite cool. So a, a huge shout out to Chris Stranger to getting people to sort of, to sort of take ClojureScript more seriously. It was definitely a big step forward there. Okay, so that, th at that point you saw, you saw uh, after Lighttable, you definitely saw more people picking up ClojureScript, which is cool. <coughs> but I want to talk a little bit now, switch gears just a tiny bit to talk about the, uh, the Clojure and Clojure idea, right? So ClojureScript um <coughs> was almost, from the beginning, the bootstrap was always there as a possibility. Uh, but there were definitely some obstacles. Uh, on this one is interesting because this was both relevant for bootstrap, but also relevant for debugging. Because as we entered the two-year mark, um, one huge problem would be that, so somebody would, a uh, closure programmer would try closure script, they use CLJS build, they've seen light table, that's awesome. They want to start building something. And then they get a, 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 an error. And then 
um, the code that they're looking at is like this crazy JavaScript, right? Because we weren't like CoffeeScript. We had no intention of ever producing anything readable, right? I, I specifically said earlier, the only thing we cared about is how fast is it going to be? You know, like that's all we cared about was performance. We didn't care about is this something for humans to look at. Um, and so there was a huge problem here. In order to make the code debuggable, uh, we, we need really needed source mapping. And for two years, uh, ClojureScript did not have source mapping. Um, I mean, part of that was stalled by there wasn't great support in browsers yet, but once there was support in browsers, we just hadn't done the work. Um, part of the problem, though, was that we actually reused the standard Clojure reader that's written in Java, right? So, so ClojureScript really piggybacked on a lot of the functionality that was already in Clojure, the Clojure reader. Now, the problem with the Clojure reader, the reader which actually reads text and converts it into data structures which represents your program, before the compiler sees it, that thing is what annotates every symbol and every S expression with file, line, and column, except the closure reader did not record the column, right? So this was a huge problem to get accurate um, results from uh, the source mapping support that was present in, in web browsers. So this was just, we were blocked uh, because we were piggybacking on uh, closure to do this, but closure was missing the functionality that we needed. Um, then a very nice gentleman, uh, Nicola Mometto, and you're going to see this. Like, like people, I think, often misconstrue that. I, I mean, I definitely do a lot of work on ClojureScript, but so much of, of each significant advancement came from somebody in the community and not necessarily myself. Uh, Nicola Mometto worked on, uh, had this project called Blind, and it was a faithful implementation of the reader, and uh, it was written in Clojure. So it wasn't written in Java. So, so there's two benefits here. One is that, okay, it's possible if now, now that it's in Clojure, porting it to ClojureScript is going to be trivial. So that's one, one benefit. The other benefit was that because we weren't tied to Clojure's development timeline, right? So the core team has a lot of things they have to think about, a lot of things they have to consider. And adding column information is not necessarily the most high priority thing, right? But Tools Reader being a standalone, separate, open source effort, Nicola, please add column information. I need it. Uh, it, it was much easier to get to, for that to happen. He was the only committer, and um, I convinced him to make a contrib project, tools.reader, um, and we swapped it. We just swapped it out because it was, again, a faithful uh, implementation of the reader. And then <coughs> I spent uh, two weeks on source mapping uh, and a lot of work. And this isn't like, remember, this is 2012, so it's nights and weekends for me. I'm working at the New York Times. This is, this is not my job to fix debugging for ClojureScript. This is just uh, a fun open source thing for me. Um, so after two weeks, uh, implementing source mapping is really a pain in the butt uh, because when you get it wrong, uh, it's, it's one of these cases, like it's this really crazy um, MIDI-inspired uh, 64, uh, base 64 encoding thing where you have these, these bits, let them compress and like, anyways, it's horrible. So debugging, it's really ter a terrible experience, and I got burned out. Even after two weeks of like doing this on the weekends, I was like, ah, nobody's helping me. I'm just like the only person that cares about this working, and no, there's nobody's helping me. And so I, I set it aside for like two months, even though I had made like a lot of progress. Uh, and once again, uh, it's the cl it's the awesome closure script community that stepped forward uh, and made it and made it really happen. So Sean Grove jumped on IRC and was like. I see that you basically did all the foundational work for source mapping. What is it going to take to finish it? Because he was um, building a, a, a product in ClojureScript, and he was losing his mind at looking at the generated JavaScript. Um, and so he uh, collaborated with me. He finished it, and it basically took it 98% of the way there. And then I just had to wrap up the last 2%. And then right at two years, basically, or two years and a month, uh, ClojureScript had source maps. And that was another huge change, right? Suddenly, a lot more closure, closure programmers were like, okay, that's really great. I can now get um, sensible step, you know, you can set breakpoints, you can step debug, uh, and that's just a huge usability uh, uh, win. Uh, so today, like, and, and, and actually uh, in Chrome, you know, you're going to get syntax highlighted, closure code, and you can set breakpoints, and it's amazing. It's like your browser is a list machine. This is uh, still to this day, I, I, it never ceases to amaze me. I've got all my closure script here in the source, in the browser, uh, and it's awesome. And it, and it works reasonably well. It could definitely work better, but it, it works reasonably well. Um, okay, so that was uh, source mapping. Uh, another project, so this one is, you know, some of the things that we do in ClojureScript are let's fix the problem 
the immediate problem. So some of those things are like source mapping. Some of those things are like persistent data structures. Some of the things we work on um, are, well, uh, if this is going to be a problem in the future, or it may be something we want to have flexibility on in the future. So JS modules was something that I predicted would eventually be become important. And, and actually, may st it's still a bit ahead of us. It's not quite important yet, but it will probably eventually be critical that we have a good answer. Uh, and this is because um, uh, compiling ES6 is becoming more and more of a thing. Uh, people are shipping their code as ES6. Um, uh, that's that's, one, that's one, one problem. The other is that then you have really interesting libraries that are written in the AMD format, or real, a really interesting library written in CommonJS, or a really interesting library written in Node.js, which is a really jacked up version of CommonJS. So you have all these competing module formats, but the, but the libraries there are, are useful. You want to be able to use something for NPM, or you want to use an ES6 library. Uh, what are you going to do? How do you integrate that stuff into, into your, your closure project? So um, I, I decided this was probably something we should invest some time in. And uh, we were involved in Google Summer of Code. So I said, this sounds like a good project for Google Summer of Code. And um, uh, there were a bunch of other ideas for a closure script for this. This was not this past summer, because we didn't get in this past summer, but the summer before. Well, there were a lot of interesting projects, but really this was the only one that was going to really have a considerable amount of, amount of impact. And impact, you know, we're talking about years into the future. Uh, and I got really lucky. Maria Geller said, I'm interested in solving that problem. Uh, and this was really awesome. And so she was a, somebody who had, I thought, she signed up for this, and I think she'd been doing closure for like three months. And she signed up for this um, Summer of Code project. Uh, and so by the end of the summer, she ended up being an expert in the ClojureScript compiler. Somebody who had just learned Clojure ended up being a ClojureScript compiler expert. And I think she may be the only one uh, that has contributed to ClojureScript that actually got patches into the Google Clojure compiler uh, and successfully, because it's actually Google, a lot of people don't know this, but like if you submit something to Google Clojure and it breaks anything within Google internally, they have, they have a whole system for automatically backing out your changes. That's how important Google Clojure compiler is uh, to Google internally. So she got her patches in so that we could um, have better module integration. Um, but it's also another point about con contributing to ClojureScript. Here's somebody who, who wasn't that familiar with Clojure, and people may you, may, you may think, the ClojureScript compiler has got to be so complicated and so sophisticated. And it's really not. It's, it's, if you're writing Clojure or ClojureScript programs, it's the same stuff. You know, we, we have multi-methods, and, and we have maps, and we have vectors. It's all the same stuff. It's really not any more complicated than what you're doing. Um, I highly recommend watching Maria's talk last year at the con, where she talks, at, you know, she walks through the whole compilation flow. She does a, she does an incredible job making it seem approachable. Um, highly recommended. Okay, so those are those are some of the better stories uh, about ClojureScript development. But not everything, in not everything is awesome. This is one of my favorite quotes about Rich Hickey. Uh, you know. Open source is, is a funny thing. Uh, you know, basically what happens with open source is you work on stuff when you want to work on it because nobody's paying you to do it, right? Um, and sometimes that means things get left undone for a very, very long time. So um, uh, pprint, uh, pretty printing, which many tools use in Clojure. If you're in Clojure, you're probably using it all the time, uh, maybe indirectly. Um, this had remained unported for four years. And every time, and the reason, <laughs> the reason I couldn't bring myself to do it is because if you've ever looked at pprint, pprint is written in 2009 era closure code. It uses defstruct, which hopefully some of you have never heard of. Um, and, and pprint is a port in 2009 style closure of, a com of common lisp code, right? The, the common lisp pretty printer. And so it's just like every time, and it was 3,000 lines of closure. Every time I would look at it, I would close my tab, right? I was like, cannot bring myself to do this. And um, uh, so, so it languished. And it was a, a huge problem because really uh, to not have it was really a huge bummer for people who are coming to Clojure. There's all this stuff in the standard library in Clojure. And when you use Clojure script, oh, it's great, it's great, it's great. What? Why isn't this thing there? And it's really um, a bad experience. Um, so. It didn't get done, and it's unfortunate, but uh, uh, once again, the community stepped forward, and they made it happen. And, and it was Jonathan Boston and Sean LeBron. Um, they, it was, it was, I think, the single biggest uh, PR or, or patch. It was like a 3,000-line patch, one huge patch, uh, which implemented preprint. 
Uh, and this was really big, because again, if you're doing development and you're like, you're doing reagent or you're doing ROM, you're doing ohm, and you're like, got this huge state atom, you're just like, please, I just want to pretty print the state of my application. You can finally do this uh, and not set your hair, hair on fire. So again, another huge contribution from the community uh, that makes ClojureScript better. Um, I had to, I, there, this, this is the one case, like, so another case where something didn't get done for four years was <laughs> testing, which is really unfortunate because I think Clojure was one of these amazing languages that like, Clojure had a testing story like before 1.0. Uh, Rich Hickey had added um, uh, uh, support for test metadata on functions and that was like super cool. It was like, wow, testing is like a first class thing in a programming language. Um, but that did not happen for a closure script. And uh, finally, I, I ended up doing this. So there had been a third party thing by Chaz, Chaz Emmerich, who some of you may know, he, he wrote the great O'Reilly closure programming book. He had done something. But you know, again, um, in the end, uh, uh, your end user wants to know that the difference between closure and closure script is the same. Why do I have to include a third party dependency to do basic testing? Why isn't the basic functionality of the programming language there? Um, so anyway, some random person on the internet you know, contributed this thing. Um, and, and that really closed, that really, this, that was sort of the last puzzle piece of the standard core namespaces. Once that was done, um, uh, a person could sit down and reasonably expect all the functionality that's in Clojure, that's not around multi-threading, uh, to be present in Clojure script. So that took four years. Sometimes things take a really, really, really long time. If you're coming to Clojure Script right now, and like in 2016, you're really lucky. You missed you missed some a lot of turbulence. Um, okay, and then and then the other thing is that five years in, um, uh, we're finally now that these sort of bigger problems have settled down, we're finally being able to focus on some of the this earlier promise. So Rich was like, Clojure Script's about reach. This is finally there's going to be a way to deal with like iOS and Android. But you know, four years go by, and actually nobody's really said they've successfully done anything. Um, and a huge person that's done a lot here, especially in open source and making sure that uh, ClojureScript as a project is compatible um, with these great mobile platforms is Mike Fikes. So Mike Fikes, you may know him because he has this thing called Plank, which is really cool. But it was Mike Fikes, he actually shipped an application on the App Store with ClojureScript. And he built a lot of infrastructure around making um, the ClojureScript development experience on iOS uh, great. And a lot of that's been repurposed um, to some degree uh, for Android. But he built this really amazing thing called Ambly, which I, if you haven't seen this, I highly recommend it. Um, and I think it, it would be a great model uh, for mobile development. But basically, it's a thing. It's a REPL, a custom REPL. Uh, so the other great thing about Ambly was that because we wanted to do Ambly, his REPL server, it required us to refactor the way that REPLs worked so that it was easier to make custom REPLs. And so he built a REPL that actually finds your iOS device. So you make an app. You're building an, uh, an iOS app. It, it broadcasts over the Wi-Fi network via Bonjour, ZeroConf, multicast DNS. So it finds it. So you're in a REPL on your desktop, and it says, do you want to connect to this device? You, just, you press in the number of the REPL you want to connect to, boom, you're, you're logged in. And what we're, we have a connection to JavaScript core uh, via a socket. And then what we do is you're just compiling your files uh, on, your, on your desktop, and we're synchronizing all those files onto the iOS device uh, via uh, WebDAV. That's pretty slick. And so he, again, he built a lot of cool apps. And, and basically, um, you can basically build uh, iOS apps um, untethered from Xcode, right? You can actually don't need Xcode at all. You just need Xcode to bootstrap. But after that, uh, you're just programming directly against iOS live coding. Uh, so the thing that we really love about Clojure, which is live coding, live programming, uh, this is completely possible on iOS now, which is really cool. So this is, again, probably more future looking as we heard about React Native. React Native, it's obviously a huge, there's a huge potential there. Uh, and we're making, we're finally making good on it. Um, so some work to do, definitely some hurdles. But wow, OK, it's happening. The, this thing that Rich was talking about five years ago, uh, the reach. OK, so last thing I'm going to talk about is Bootstrap. So this was last year. Um, so uh, mm, if you've only been doing Clojure for, Clojure Script for one year, you missed the, the four years where we didn't even have like real version numbers. It was just the, the Git revision number. So you know, I think the last, the last version before we had real version numbers was like 3,225. Um, and the reason we switched to real version numbers was last year, um, Rich and et al., the core team, finally decided to deliver on reader conditionals. So ClojureScript 
and Clojure, even though they were effectively the same language, there was no really, there was no real official way to share code between both languages. You had CL, .clj files for Clojure, .clj.js files uh, for Clojure script. There were a bunch of hacky tools that which, were f which worked okay uh, to allow you to share code, but um, they all suffered because they weren't official solutions. And so uh, 1.7, Clojure 1.7 released reader conditionals allowing you to write, write .clj.c files, common files shared by both uh, programming languages. And of course, what do I do? As soon as they land reader conditionals, I, 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 I bump the version, to the dependency version in Clojure script. I'm like, we can, we, can just we, can just we can just compile the compiler now, right? That was literally the first thing I did was, OK, I'm going to convert all the compiler and the analyzer, analyzer files to .clj.c, and I'm going to run the compiler on itself. What doesn't work? And so for a month, it was just me slowly working through the analyzer, slowly working to the compiler, un until the point that both of those uh, files could successfully be compiled. Um, that was a lot of fun, uh, because at the other end of that, we were going to have something really cool, which was a version of Clojure Script that could run uh, without the JVM. It could be completely self-hosted, which is, you know, cool for, it's like a very lispy thing to do. Um, so uh, at the moment, this was like the final moment before I was done. Um, this file, this is the macros file. Uh, so there's a file called clj.core, which is just um, .clj. It's just all the macros uh, the, um, that we use. And, and again, these are the compile time macros, right? Uh, so so the, the, the it's right here that it gets really funny. This is tying the knot and getting a little bit metacircular, right? This, this macro file is requiring the standard library and the analyzer, right? So this is sort of tying the knot. We're, we're sort of requiring ourselves again. Um, and, and, you know, people complain a, a little bit, but I think people are finally used to it about the fact that macros are sort of a, a compile time thing. But it's actually specifically because it's a compile time thing that bootstrapping Clojure Script was so straightforward, right? All I had to do was compile the analyzer in the compiler, and then all I have to do is take those two generated JavaScript files and append them to the standard library, and we're done. We don't have this crazy talking to the compiler and talking to the runtime at the same time because um, there are two distinct phases in Clojure Script. There's macro time and there's runtime, and they'll never meet. But that means bootstrapping Clojure Script was uh, a very, very, very straightforward affair. And we've already seen uh, the benefits of that today with Clips. There's people make awesome demos all the time. You've got Plank, which is a really great REPL that runs on Linux, Windows, OS 10. You've got um, uh, what's it? What's it? Replete for iOS, which is a full-blown uh, Clojure Script REPL on your iOS phone. So if you're on the Metro, you can you can hack Clojure uh, while you're while you're uh, while you're waiting to get to work. And it, and it's particularly because it actually uses uh, par infer, which is also a really amazing innovation from the Clojure community, which infers the location of your parentheses based on indentation. So you don't need a crazy keyboard. It's amazing. Um, so. That, that, that gives a sense of wh what's happened. You know, so uh, hope I, I'm sure that many of you weren't aware of all the various things that happened. So this gives a sense of how much work is involved, how many people are involved. Um, of course, there are many more people. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't show everybody's photo or, or, or thank everybody's names. But there's been no contribution that's too small. So there's now, I think, 141 con contributors. Literally every single person that's ever opened an issue, that ever jumped on IRC and asked a question that said, is this how it's supposed to work, um, that ever filed um, a ticket or a patch. Uh, it's everybody that's made um, this project great. Uh, we, it, it, Clojure Script is as good as it is today uh, because everybody that's worked on it. Uh, other cool things that happen. I mean, I haven't even, again, I've been focusing mostly on Clojure Script itself because um, we could spend, you know, weeks talking about all the other cool things, but I'll summarize. Um, of course, things really changed with, um, with the appearance of React. Because suddenly Clojure Script was okay. That's doesn't that's weird. Okay, you have immutable immutable data structures, but you have to talk to this horrible thing called the DOM, so it doesn't really matter, right? And it was really React that was just like you know the floodgates were open, you know Cambrian explosion, right? Uh, suddenly there were all these libraries that integrate with React, and now like Clojure Script is like ahead of the pack, like way ahead of the pack in like what's the best way to do UIs? Uh, we're definitely at the forefront, and in many ways. Uh, the React community is still catching up. Like, I went to the React conference, and, and like, you go up there, and they're like, flux. And you're like, ah, that's horrible. <laughs> you know, so I, th I think we're way ahead in terms of, of what React is good for and, and, and 
how we should go about uh, doing UI work. And so it's super inspiring to me and exciting to see uh, the ClojureScript community um, really, really go way further than a lot of other uh, sort of stuff happening in the mainstream. Um, lots of other cool things happen, like CLJF Dev Tools. If you haven't seen this, so this solves the problem. I don't know his real name. I just know his online handle, Darwin or something. But he wrote a Chrome extension which uses Chrome's custom object printing. So even though source mapping is great, you know when you when you log a vector, it's like this horrible JavaScript object, and you don't want to look at that. And so he actually has custom printing of of ClojureScript data structures inside the web browser, whether you're step debugging or whether you're interacting with the console. It's awesome. It's really, really cool. If you haven't checked it out, you most definitely should. Um, and, then, and then there's another thing about open source which I really love, which is that sometimes people do competing projects. So ClojureScript is not just the story of like, what were all the things we did in core? What were the, what were the better ideas that people had that weren't in core? Uh, so Shadow Build was a sort of a competing build tool um, by Thomas Heller. And Thomas Heller was very active in, in discussions. He, you know, he submitted some patches, which is great. But you know, Shadow Build was his idea of how the Clojure Script compiler should work as a build tool. And it took, I think, about a year and a half. There were many things that Shadow Build did that we did not do. For example, Google Clojure modules, which allow you to do code splitting. So he had that in for like months before we had it. Um, the new feature where we can infer whether something is a macro, macro var or runtime var, so you don't have to do refer macros. This existed in Shadow Build uh, long before it existed um, in ClojureScript itself. So a lot of times, uh, the, the best source of ideas are, are just people doing their own thing. Uh, and that's also really, really great. OK, so uh, ClojureScript is an iterative, iterative process. It's sort of a random walk in the right direction, right? So <laughs> you can expect in the next five years, it's probably going to be a random walk in the right direction. Things will happen when people want them to happen. Um, so my, my talk, my, my title is a bit misleading, but I wanted to sort of show how, how we've been doing it, and then now you have a good expectation of, of how it's going to happen. Um, but there are some things that we want to do next, and I'm going to enumerate some of them. There are many more, but some highlights at least. So things that are always high priorities, like people, you're probably wondering, how does closure script development work? Uh, so the highest priority is always closure parity. Right, so this was, uh, as I pointed out, the, the biggest pain point in Clojure is almost always it doesn't work the same as in Clojure. Why? This doesn't make any sense. So this is always a high priority. So you can expect for the next, you know, at least until Clojure 1.9, the main thing we're working on is, is spec. So we have um, up to alpha 11 parity, and of course they've already rolled out new stuff, and that stuff will be coming. Uh, but I definitely think spec is huge. I think uh, I spec will be still be learning about what benefits spec has uh, long into the future. This is definitely, at least for the next two years, we're going to uh, begin to understand what's possible with something like spec. Um, another big one is closure compiler integration. We want the module stuff to be better. Again, Google's constantly updating stuff. They don't really care with break, they, they, they care when, if we do something to break them, but they don't really care if they break the rest of the world because they're, no, they're the only ones you'd really seriously using a closure or closure library. Um, so we are interested in staying abreast of their changes and their enhancements. Another thing, actually in five years, we've never worked on compiler performance. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, the only thing I did uh, was I did parallel build. So if you have n cores, we try to compile um, you know, each different files on different cores as much as we can. So that's for production builds, that's great. Um, but it doesn't help with serial performance. Uh, and nobody's actually ever sat down and said, okay, let's just focus on the serial performance of the compiler. I suspect there's at least a 2x perf gain right here. So y to me, like if your compile times can go down from 30 seconds to 15 seconds, and then you add parallel build and you get down to 7, that's a huge win. And I would like to see, uh, eventually I might get to this, but if somebody else is interested in it, I would love to see that happen. Windows, uh, this is probably less of a problem, but I, I mention it anyways because we don't have that many Windows users, and people are often like, ClojureScript is so awesome, but it's broken on Windows. So if you're a Windows user and you have a patch, there's a, there's a chance that I will apply it immediately. The moment I get a Windows patch, it'll probably get applied because we care. We want our stuff to work great everywhere. Um, more tests, you know. So, so maybe some of you are like, "Well, I don't. don't the compiler's too still too scary." I mean, something that's missing <laughs> in ClojureScript still is we don't have enough tests. There's there's really never there's no such thing as too many tests, um, especially with a tool that's now as sort of sophisticated as the ClojureScript compiler. We have many options. Uh, we would like to have tests for each options, 
Uh, for the runtime stuff, we would like to have generative tests. We would like to actually do generative testing of things. Uh, so maybe you're like, oh, I've got some time. Actually, I'll, I want to contribute some tests. That would be awesome. Um, runtime performance harness would be great. Um, this is probably lower priority, but it would be nice to be able to track performance, the performance of the generated code over time. Um, forward looking. So closure spec is huge. Again, I, I could say this a million times. I think it's really, really, really big. Um, but there's an obvious thing here that um, you know, we can't do all the fancy recursive stuff, but we could trivially emit uh, very basic valid, like compile time validation, right? So is this parameter nillable? Is this parameter a map or a number um, or a vector? They're very basic type checks um, that we could actually convert into static type checks to uh, Closure Compiler. We could pass them on to Closure Compiler, and at least you know, oh, we're not going to production with something where we pass nil and we didn't check for that. And that would be huge. So this is definitely something I would like to do with Closure Spec, to convert those things into um, type information with a Closure Compiler. Public APIs, this is definitely more for tooling people, but ra raise your hand if you use FigWheel. Right? So there's a lot of people. So this, this may not immediately affect you, but it, it does affect you. Because the reason FigWheel is able to do all this awesome stuff, like now it has almost, uh, almost Elm quality uh, errors about location of your errors and where things went wrong. It's beautiful. And that's only because we expose the right hooks, the right, the right public hooks inside the ClojureScript compiler. So if you want your tools to be better, that's another thing. Or if you're interested in tools becoming better, um, uh, thinking about the ClojureScript public APIs is something that's extremely important moving forward. And this is probably the, the, la the last thing before I, I switch gears again. Um, so, so this is one I'm probably going to work on myself, and I have some prototypes. So if you've been doing ClojureScript for a while, probably the largest source of incidental complexity in ClojureScript, uh, ClojureScript is awesome, but there's things that are not awesome, is externs, right? So you want to use React, or you want to use high charts, or you want to use, just use some random React component that somebody wrote. And the problem is you can do this, but when you do your production build, it's going to break because you don't have externs. Right? You don't have the, 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 the definitions that the compiler, the closure compiler, the Google closure compiler needs to know you cannot change this name. You cannot change this name. Um, and so it's extremely error prone. Even I run to this. I do an advanced build. Oh my god, I'm ready to go to production. And it doesn't work because I missed an extern. Right? It's a huge source of incidental complexity. Um, so this, I think, is actually a solvable problem and actually Probably there's a good chance we can really do a good job here. Um, but this would be huge. Uh, it would be probably the last problem that we really have when we want to integrate with third-party libraries. We would like to remove the need to ever write extern files. Like That would be a gigantic step forward uh, for integrating with, again, the wider JavaScript ecosystem. So that's most definitely on the very near future roadmap. Um, but in order for any of this stuff to happen, it requires more people or people that are interested in helping out. So you know, people, I think, uh, think that the contribution process is complicated. It's not. Uh, how, do, how to contribute? Um, submit your contributor agreement. Even if you think, you're like, I'll never contribute to Clojure or ClojureScript. Just do it. Because chances are, uh, I mean, I've, I, there are bugs that I've seen. I'm like, how is it that, we, that the people have been using ClojureScript for five years and we never found that bug? Like, Persistent maps break after nine entries on this weird case. How did we never see that? Um, and then somebody submits a patch because they look at the function, and it's a simple bug. Right? It's a simple thing. You can fix it. You know closure. Um, so submit your contributor agreement. You never know when it might be useful. Um, if you're interested in getting more involved, uh, people know I'm very active on IRC and Slack. Uh, CLJS Dev is where we talk about uh, dev stuff. Uh, uh, again, you're, everybody is welcome. Even, even you might learn something just by lurking there. So. Uh, uh, come join the fun. Um, and if you are getting involved, then look for low-hanging fruit. Don't pick some crazy task. Find something in Jira and like, be like, oh, that's a patch, and that's, I need that. Just test it and leave a comment. I tested it. It works. Um, and if you have a trivial patch, just submit it. Um, there's no, again, there's no issue that's uh, too small. OK, and then, of course, there are other forms of contribution. It's, also, it's extremely exciting to be here because this, this is huge. This is a big conference. It's like 300 people. Like I, I, I go to JavaScript conferences that aren't this big. So it's, it's definitely super exciting to me. But there are other ways to contribute that aren't so code-centric. Um, uh, for me, it's been awesome because I, I like, in 2008, I was like, I'm going to do common lists. And then that didn't really work out. And fortunately, there was closure. Uh, but really, it felt like to me, as much as I loved Lisp, Lisp seemed like oh, too weird. And, 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 you know, you look at Hacker News or you look at Reddit and, like, you look at coding blogs and it's like, it's so normal to see 
a, a blog with like closure code. Like nobody thinks this is weird. And this is the best possible thing. There's nothing weird about using a Lisp or writing Lisp. So writing about your experiences, whether you're doing React Native, you're doing Ragin or Rum or whatever, just writing about your experiences and helping people adopt the technology, that's one of the most impactful things you could possibly do. Um, of course, presentations. Give presentations to your local user groups. Give presentations at conferences. Um, uh, it's been great. I, I, ha I have to give less talks. The more, the more <laughs> you give talks on Clojure or ClojureScript somewhere, the less that we have to run around. Because, I mean, in order for Clojure, Clojure and ClojureScript to succeed, it really is, again, it's a community effort. It can't just be core team people uh, giving talks and cool presentations. Uh, and build cool stuff and talk about it. This is the only thing that, again, I believe it's the only thing that convinces developers. You can talk about fancy fe language features all day, um, but really, developers are convinced when you show them something cool. Um, so again, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, again, I, uh, hopefully I give some sense about how much effort's gone into it. And again, the reason I love ClojureScript is that every time I fire it up, it really feels, even though I've been contributing so much to it, it feels like alien technology. It feels like, I can't believe you can do this stuff. It's so cool. Um, I use all the same tools that you all use. I use CLGIS Build. There are people at Cognitech using Boot. We're using FigWheel. I mean, all this stuff that's getting developed is the same stuff. Um, and it's great to see that everybody's uh, pushing it forward. Uh, so thank you. And um, probably went over. Um, maybe I can take some questions. Um, given that you've been able to rewrite closure code in closure from with when it before it was written in Java, have you been able to backport or are you thinking about backporting some of the JavaScript generating code into actual closure so you could rewrite closure in closure instead of having the persistent data structures that are written in Java currently or like bring protocols to the core? Has the um, the kind of the other guys or the persons working on the core team been thinking about this of reusing what the closure script people have written to rewrite parts of closure in closure? Um, I mean, there's been no discussion about that, um, but I, I suspect that um, if you know, I mean, the thing is you have to prioritize, and so uh, I don't know when with closure spec being like the main focus, the dev focus right now. I don't know when they're ever going to relook, reconsider. Uh, the way that the closure compiler has been done. I do not doubt that at some point in the future they will they will revisit it. And remember, Rich wrote the first version of the closure script compiler. So that was his idea of what a closure and closure would look like. So I'm convinced that whenever they go back to do it again, it's gonna be heavily informed uh, by uh, how we did it in closure script. So there's there's definitely gonna be some sort of feedback loop as to whether um, we'll copy and paste stuff, that's you know that remains to be seen. Um, but yes, I, I'm sure that the experience of ClojureScript is going to inform, if there is a next version of Clojure, it will inform it. Hi, D David, can you just touch on Mori in the history you gave of Clojure, Clojure Script? Um, where did Mori fit into that? So Mori, so Mori was, so that's, so, okay, Mori is, um, uh, what I did was once, once we had all the persistent data structures, I was like, whoa, this is so cool, persistent data structures in JavaScript, and they're fast uh, on V8 and Node. Uh, so what I did was I made a library called Mori in which I compiled Clojure Script just the persistent data structures into a sort of idiomatic JavaScript dependency for Node.js or even front end, um, and the f and and uh, and I published the benchmarks. I compared it to JVM persistent data structures. Like these are really great numbers. You should check this out. Uh, in fact, I had numbers where um, it's faster to build um, a transient vector than it is to build um, a mutable array. Like if you want to build uh, a, a mutable JavaScript array with one million elements, it's faster to build a transient vector. Um, 
but uh, it, was, it was really hard to convince JavaScript people to use it. I mean, a few people were interested in it, but it was basic. It came out, Mori came out in 2012, and I, gave, I talked about it a little bit at JavaScript conferences, but it remained, un, JavaScript developers were uninterested in it until React, until 2014. So it took two years before anybody in the JavaScript community cared about Mori. But uh, with Mori, because Mori, um, I talked about Mori and I talked about um, React, um, I think a lot of that influenced Facebook to do Immutable JS. So there, there definitely was a very strong connection. Uh, but again, I think this goes to my point, like it's really hard to convince programmers to make decisions based only on benchmarks and technical stuff. There has to be, I think, some other thing going on and React happened to be the, the magic fairy dust that made people interested in it. Does that, hopefully this answer gives you some history and context. Hi, uh, you mentioned Maria Geller uh, working on the JS module support. What's the, what's the status of that? And is, th is there still any momentum there? Is that being carried forward? Uh, so it, uh, she, I, she, so she's the maintained CLJS build. So my, and and also my library me is. So I think she's probably a bit busy. CLJS build is still, I think, one of the most popular build tools. Um, so I don't think she has time to do the module stuff. The module stuff that she has works as well as it did in G GSOC in Google Summer of Code. So it, everything that she she showed that works right now. Um, and in fact, um, there's already been stories of people that have integrated AMD modules or common JS modules. Uh, and even with the limitations, it is useful. However, uh, it's not quite where I would like it to be. Um, first of all, Google Closure actually broke the interface that we were using. So when we bump Google Closure, we're going to have to fix her work. Uh, but more importantly, um, uh, we still haven't done like what I would call like the real test. And to me, uh, what, should, what you should be able to do if the module stuff works correctly is that you should be able to include all of React in your build. Like, you should be able to say, I want to load React component at the module React component, and you should only get, get that, and we should be able to dead code eliminate all of React that you don't use. That's the actual target, um, that, that we basically make the rest of the JavaScript world conform to us, which is that their code becomes uh, optimizable. That, that, that's the real goal here, right? Is that you can take some random JavaScript library and you can now um, apply all the benefits that we have with ClojureScript code, right? This, is, this to me is the problem with third-party stuff, is that when, you use, when, I, when I use some gigantic ClojureScript library and I only use one function, I know I'm only going to get one function. This is awesome. We don't have this, this myopic view of the world where you have micro-modules. We don't care because Google Clojure eliminates all the stuff you don't use. And I would like to be able to know that um, even third-party JavaScript libraries that we cannot control the development of, we are able to apply the same optimization techniques to. Um, so yes, this is still where we want to be. What about web, uh, web assembly? Is that good news for ClojureScript? Uh, it's it's not bad news. That's that's, that's for sure. I mean, there's uh, um, I mean I think WebAssembly immediately. Um, if you're doing high performance numeric stuff, I mean, you could immediately be like, oh, I could write a, a cool DSL for WebAssembly so I can get super optimized ClojureScript functions for my game or something. There's obviously no downsides um, there. Um, the bigger question as to whether it's the right solution um, for uh, uh, as a compilation target for a closure script? I mean, that's a bigger question. There are lots of things that need to happen with WebAssembly before we can go there. Uh, closure script, like Clojure, assumes the presence of a high-performance GC, um, and there's no GC integration story for WebAssembly. You, you would have to write you know, your own GC, and that sounds like a performance nightmare. Um, but, but the final word hasn't been said, right? I know that the WebASM committee, they're aware of that limitation, uh, so it may be that 10 years or maybe six years or maybe maybe it's sooner. I, I have no idea. Maybe sooner. If it becomes a desirable target, there's no question. We will target it if, it, if it's the right thing. But it's cool. It's, a, it's absolutely cool. It definitely closes the gap in the types of performance you would get, expect to get out of a browser environment. Hi. So um, Maria's work and the external stuff you mentioned at the end, is that 
related? Is it the same, or is it completely uh, like off the mark? So they're they're um, they're somewhat complementary, right? So if you could consume third-party libraries, then you wouldn't have to write externs. <laughs> like if you could actually consume them, truly consume them, and pass them to Google Closure, you wouldn't need externs for them anyway. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is. Um, Maybe, maybe you use random, random library one, and it's ES6, and you're like, boom, it just works. It just works. But then you use some other thing, and you're like, ooh, it doesn't work. Why not? Okay, I'm just going to include it as a part of my build and keep it out of the advanced compilation. But with the externs inference, you wouldn't have to write an externs file for that. So yes, all of these things are designed to make integration with the wider ecosystem better, um, but they're sort of attacking it from two different ways. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for your patience and uh, yeah.